yeah just keep an eye on the video when it'll go live and pause right so we are live and we're here with uh, paul tremeling i'm sure you are very familiar with him uh, if you've not watched the interviews go back and watch the two parts we have there and um yeah paul what's been happening since the last time we chatted uh, good to see you, Mike. Um, a bit of action with the book, that sort of thing. But um, uh, by and large, then um, just just steady state jogging at this end. And uh, thank you for having me this evening. Absolutely. But uh, in case people are not aware of you and your career, can you just give a couple of minutes background so people can get their questions coming in? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. It'd be a pleasure. So uh, my name is Paul Tremelling. Uh, I joined the Royal Navy as uh, what's called a supplementary list aviator. So essentially someone with no interest whatsoever in driving ships in 1996. <laughs> and uh, was then went into the flying training pipeline. I completed elementary flying training, uh, which was joined with, with the Royal Air Force, with the Army Air Corps, etc., and was initially streamed to go to helicopters. So I then flew at the Defence Helicopter Flying School in Shawbury. But off the end of that, I was selected to go fixed wing. So uh, flew the Takano and the Hawk aircraft before making my way to the Sea Harrier. I uh, successfully passed the Sea Harrier course and did a frontline tour from where I was in uh, given a basically an instructor's job, I did the air warfare instructor's course, and then went uh, to the headquarters squadron as an a a AY, as we called it, air warfare instructor, um, back to the front line as an air warfare instructor, and then because of defence cuts, etc., the Sea Harrier went out of service, blew the GR7 and GR9 uh, on the next couple of tours, and ended up as the second in command of the naval strike wing. Uh, and uh, after a bit of um, uh, out of area type stuff, so, uh, for example, I went with the, the, the French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle and then to LME, the operation in support of uh, op ops over Libya, I uh, went on HMS Ocean and Albion to that. And after that, I went to the Super Hornet, and that was my last flying tour. Um, so I flew the Super Hornet with the US Navy. And then the last cool job, really, was uh, I was the F-35 desk officer. So uh, I was in charge of essentially buying the F-35 for, for the UK at, at desk level. Brilliant. So, yeah, guys, get your questions coming in for ball, but I've got one uh, while we start off. You must be excited about Top Gun, and that plane, obviously, Maverick flew the same jet as you, so you must be... can't wait. <laughs> uh, I, I absolutely can't wait, um, Mike. I, I think you would have to be... there'd be something clinically wrong with you to not be excited <laughs> about Top Gun, and uh, I can't do the maths out loud, but we've waited long enough, haven't we? The first... The first film was it was a fabulous film wasn't it iconic film iconic jet f-14 um and yeah i, I think uh, that, that hopefully we're going to see the same again some of the the um trailers and the and the, the shots that we've seen so far have been uh, amazing haven't they so we're uh, looking forward to that absolutely as you can see there's some questions coming in on the side for you there paul so i'm going to let you loose and guys enjoy Thank you very much, Mike, and, and uh, everyone else who's joining. Thank you for having me. So there's a there's a couple of um, questions come up right at the top, and I, forgive me if I mispronounce your your names, but it, it's something like G hash PL. Uh, sorry if I've got that uh, incorrect. Um, but you've asked me which cockpit I liked better, which was more comfortable and ergonomically friendly. The, the, the truth of the matter is that the GR79, being a Harrier II, which came out of the McDonnell um, family, and the Super Hornet, which came out, which is now the Boeing family. So, so a, a lot of key up common DNA there. Very, very similar. In fact, some of the HOTAS, particularly not HOTAS, the, the um, data entry, etc., was was very germane between the, uh, the the two. So you can't really choose between them. I think that uh, the, the the Super Hornet as a as a sort of overall blended package was probably better. But cockpit management wise, GR seven nine and Super Hornet, uh, both about the same. Sea Harrier, not quite the same. Uh, more um, to do in the cockpit, but that's probably why we loved it. And I'll just answer uh, one more of your questions because you've asked two and they're, they're very similar. So uh, carrier brake landing in an F-18, the landing that we would do in an F-18, so fly past the ship, brake to land, uh, that's what we would do on a case one day. So case one is what you would do in um, when the weather was clear and, and you were big and hard enough to get back to the um, ship on your own, obviously. Uh, exactly the same with a uh, V-style aeroplane. So um, we still call it case one. And so you would hover case one off the, off the end of one of those. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, I, I've said this and I'll um, probably be arguing about it till the day I die, but never mind. My view of this is that the V-style landing by day is the easiest I found the night trap the second easiest, and that might sound weird, but, um, but it's so simple. There's only three things you need to see, which are meatball angle of attack and lineup. At night, they are the only three things you can see. And um, 
that made it simple for me. Uh, and I thought that the day trap was probably the, the next um, hardest because of all the procedures. There's so many procedures by day, probably really easy if you're US Navy, if you're new to it like I was, um, not so much. And then by night, uh, V-Stole by night, easily the hardest because you're descending into the, the darkness beside a ship, not actually flying towards it. Uh, and that's why I, I found it tough. So, so hopefully that makes sense and that, that hopefully um, answers your questions. Hi, Templar7832, good to see you too. Um, so, Mike, Mike Stranford, a great question. The, 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 the simple uh, truth about the Harrier and the Sea Harrier are that it's actually a bit of a tragedy as far as the story goes, in so much as when the heroes went down to the Falklands in 1982, the previous year, the YAV-8B had flown. So the Harrier 2 was uh, already out on the streets by the time the Falklands War took place. So when the uh, Royal Navy went from FRS Fighter Reconnaissance Strike Mark 1 to Mark 2, there was already a Harrier 2 on the streets. And, and the FA-2 prototype didn't fly till uh, 88, and they didn't come into service till 1993. The same year, I think, someone will probably correct me in the comments, please do, as the AV-8B2 Plus did. So absolutely would it have been better. Um, and, and people, you, you know, you can get bunched about the um, would it have been harder to take take out of service? Yeah, you can argue that, I suppose. But we ran out of money, didn't we? So something had to go. But the long and the short of it is it, it would have probably been better um, every day. Well, what, why wouldn't you want a radar up the front of a, uh, a mud mover? And I, I read some absolute nonsense by some senior officers about, oh, the, the radar wouldn't make a difference. Of course it would. Uh, more situational awareness it actually tightens up your bombs quite nicely as well when you get it staring at the target. So, um, so yes, Martin, great question. Uh, what what should have happened is we should have had the FA9, obviously, but 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 we didn't, and um, and and that's just uh, spilt milk. We can uh, cry over. I'm still crying over it, by the way. So um, there we are. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, let me just check. Jack, good evening. Um, I'm in Flint here from what, what's our, what's, right, Jack. So th this is, a, um, again, a really simple physical question. Jack's asked about what's, what's my view of the choice of the carriers. My view at the time, and I think I would say this to this day, is that um, aviation, aerospace is obviously... Uh, bounded by the laws of physics. And in the F-35, you get the choice. You can either take more bombs to the party, more fuel, or you can take a lift fan. And I believe that we've therefore got a uh, more limited platform than the rest. It is fantastic. Don't get me wrong. F-35B is fantastic. But personally, as an operator, I'd rather be taking bombs or, or more gas to the fight. So I would rather have seen us have a bit more patience and a bit more uh, ambition and gone for a cats and traps um, carrier. I, I think the truth of the matter is that British industry could not deliver the cat and trap carrier. Uh, and that, that's just where we are. I mean, it, it took a while, didn't it, to get the, the, the B-Store carriers out and about and a huge amount of money. Uh, don't, again, do want to foot stomp the fact, though, that our carriers are superb. The jet, the F-35B is superb. And the boys and girls seem to be doing a brilliant job of um, uh, bringing it into service, if that makes sense. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Mike, so I'll go now to the Freckle Puny. Is that uh, how we're going to pronounce that? Um, uh, the, the, the initial dislike of the Super Hornet. Well, well um, the, the snag that you have, this is, this is a, probably a fundamental point to get across, which will hopefully make sense, is that uh, air power enthusiasts tend to play, I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, the uh, top trumps. So you tend to look at um, aircraft of how many bombs they can carry, how how fast they can go, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the Super Hornet is not as fast as other aircraft. I think, you know, we topped out, uh, I believe, at Mach 1.5. Um, and that's easily fast enough. You, you don't need much more than that. And yes, there are jets that can go quicker. But I think even the Typhoon in RAF service is limited to maybe Mach 1.8. Um, and to get there, you, you know, you're chucking gas out the back. So um, I, I don't necessarily think you need to be looking at those, the, the very ends of the envelopes to find out how useful or otherwise uh, an aircraft is. Um, and the, the proof of the pudding really is the fact that the US Navy, I guess, are very happy with it to the point that there was actually real resistance to the F-35 within the carrier community, mainly on the uh, grounds of 
it only having a a, a sing, single engine. I'd say a lot of criticism comes from ignorance. Um, uh, again, I'll, I'll try and pronounce your name correctly, Freckle Puny, but only because um, when, when you're fighting air to air and air to air to surface, there's so much about the fight that is absolutely nothing to do with the aeroplane. You know, the aeroplane is nothing to do with your um, basing option. It's nothing to do with how much fuel you're carrying to get back home and then possibly divert. It's, it's nothing to do with pilot currency. It's nothing to do with how many um, hours, years, tours you, you've got in, in the bank. So um, a- actually, I, I think you're, you're probably right. And what hopefully folk like me can bring to the party is the yeah buts and the what ifs. So you say, well, well, okay, so the um, Super Hornet's slow. Well, okay, yeah, but um, ha- how many times do you actually need to go above Mach 1.5? Even if you're running out super with a, with a threat behind you, beyond the number as, as we used to do, um, how many times do you need to go uh, any faster and wouldn't you rather have an extra couple of amrams oh by the way i can carry 10 in the super hornet when i turn around the corner because i want to give him a face full of pain so um so yeah th- there's there's always nuance there's always the yeah buts and, uh, and the what ifs if that makes sense um and i think that probably uh, answers martin's question as well um because w- when do you actually want to go supersonic really it's only when you're running away um uh, to be honest um well, that's that's one uh, function of it in any case. And actually, the great thing about the Sea Harrow is we could go very high. And it's no um, secret that if you can get modern weapons up high into the thin stuff, because guess what? They follow a lofted trajectory when you fire them. Then that's really cool, right? And that, that gives them a lot more legs than just um, speed goes. Because what you're not necessarily after is how long over the earth the weapon goes. It's how far you can get it from yourself, because that's what keeps you alive when you're fighting um, other people. Hopefully that makes sense. So, so you want to throw the weapon a long way from you. Um, if you're right behind the weapon because you're still um, sort of following it into the, um, the fight, then that, that's a really, really bad thing. Um, would I swap an F-18EF for the F-14D in any way? Well, uh, well, the answer to that is obviously yes, because uh, I can fly one and I've never had a go on the other. Um, there used to be some uh, really good <laughs> apocryphal stories about the f-14 like how much it leaked and people would follow them into away from the ship etc and and uh and rather than on the like this the hornet super hornet where we say mate you got a leak you need to go back an f-14 uh, driver would probably say well, well well how big is it um and we could probably get into the twin seat single seat bit at some point if you uh if you fancied that but uh, personally I'd, I'd rather take the um f-18 e into battle over just about anything to be honest so yes i so I would definitely swap anything for an F-18E in, you know, take, if, if it was genuinely going into combat and it was genuinely tomorrow with a, with a multi-role or a self-escort strike role. I know I'm biased. I know other folk will disagree with me. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, right. So, Henry, good evening. Combat deployments. Um, so, so yes and no. Um, we did not um, participate in Op Enduring Freedom. We had our own operation out in Afghanistan called Herrick. So we did them side by side and we would do uh, op enduring feeding OEF tasking as, as part of Herrick. So hopefully that makes sense. And yeah, I did a combat tour out in Afghanistan in 2008. I then flew a uh, spare out into theatre when one of our younger guys decided to break his into three pieces on the runway. And then I did a um, uh, supporting role combat cruise with the French. And I, actually, to be honest, I know this is not aviation, well, not, not aviation per se, but uh, supporting the op in Libya was actually a, a career highlight as well. I was afloat. I was just a classic naval officer, but my job was to liaise with the air power, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, Fleur, <laughs> Fleur is a uh, neuropilot. Good evening. The, um, the Fleur is very, very handy in Afghanistan for seeing through dust. So, uh, And a runway stands out really well on a Fleur through dust, and it stands out incredibly badly uh, with your eyes, because obviously it's the same colour as, as the dust that would be uh, useful. Fleurs are actually also really useful in the UK for low flying in winter, when you've got that really low uh, winter sun it, it, flying south. In the uh, UK low flying system, which is uh, re- a really good bit of airspace, by the way, world class. Uh, and it's just a shame, isn't it, that we don't see so many aeroplanes low level around the um, Mac Loop and, uh, and various places nowadays. But uh, but the Fleur are really useful uh, about in the in the Harrier. You could have um, Fleur up in the head up display as well, which I like. That, that's how we, we flew at night. 
uh, with, with your, your head-up display uh, way lay, laid on top of the floor picture was up on the um, uh, one in front of you. Uh, longest flight in my career, Carl? Um, no idea. We ran out of uh, oil in about eight hours, so it would be just, just, just shy of that, I think. And uh, geographically, um, tanking trips from the UK to Cyprus, Cyprus, Aldafra, Aldafra, um, Colombo, I think we went next in 03 when we went to um, Flying Fish. So one of those would sort of probably be the geographical longest. Or, or actually, um, uh, where do we go? Uh, Bermuda to Larges when you're crossing the pond. That, that's a long one. And, and to, to stay vaguely safe, you actually sort of have to um, keep a bit of land on your left-hand side in that case. So we were quite close to Canada. So a, a long, old flight. Okie dokie. Uh, hopefully, these are scratching the itch, as it were. So, um, Figmo 4.2. Um, I, I, I think that the best way of describing the ESA is, uh, for, for, for folks who don't know, a uh, mechanical, mechanically scanned radar is essentially a, a radar, it's a plate, and uh, from it you get a fan of uh, electromagnetic energy. Um, goes out, ping, comes back, pong, divided by two, you've got your target. Okay, that's oversimplifying it, and, and apologies if that's a, a little bit condescending for a couple of people. What, what an AESA does is actually it's got uh, a, a large amount of active um, cells all pumping out radar energy. And if you think about it as uh, essentially almost like a, a harbour wall where you've got um, uh, a, uh, waves diffracting on the far side, if you line them all up, you get a pencil beam. That's how that works. What does that mean? It means you can get an awful lot of troms downrange on target and you can steer it essentially at the speed of light. Um, that means that uh, you can keep a lot of SA on a lot of targets. You don't need to neck down your scan uh, to get more troms on targets. And also, if uh, someone is looking back at you with their radar, think of it as basically a torch or um, if you're from America, a flashlight uh, looking in the dark. That's how radars work. Um, an ESA is like having a sun pointed the other way. So uh, with mech scan radars, for example, on the Sea Harrier, it was quite common that we would um, interact badly, so mutually interfere with other radars. And when you're, when you're um, fire, firing weapons against um, dumb mud movers, et cetera, without radars, then very clean radar picture and the, and the tracks were very solid. If it's a fighter, there's every chance that the, your track would get um, interrupted by the uh, interference coming back so you had to be very careful to, to monitor that with with an AESA you are really causing the other people um, massive amounts of uh, trouble so uh, so yeah uh, uh, fabulous and um, the way I'll describe it is uh, you've got to think of radar theory as um, think of yourself standing in the middle of a big warehouse at night with a pencil torch and you're trying to find the bats and you only get hits on them every now and again and you're trying to work out where the um, where that means they're tracking so you hit one up here hit one there hit one there he's probably going that way Acer is like switching the lights on in the house. It is night and day. It's an absolutely staggering performance. Hopefully that um, uh, answers that one. Uh, Timberwolf, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do you much use with these ones here um, on the grounds that I, I did I did see something strange um, once just whipped past the canopy, but but to be honest, it was it was very very close and and and, and went past very very quickly. In fact, I hurt my head uh, tracking it. But but again, I, I I honestly don't know what it was. It could have been a high flying bird, could have been a drone. Pass, don't know. Uh, and I am unfamiliar with your uh, commander Fravo, um contact, so so sadly no. So um, apologies for that one. That's not a great uh, answer, etc. Um, uh, Neuro pilot. Um, yeah, I flew with um, APG 79, 80 Fleur. Um, I disagree with you, however. 80 Fleur is a horrible pod compared to some of the um, other pods. It's nowhere near as good as Sniper or Lightning, or certainly wasn't when I flew with it. It's, uh, however, comma, it can survive a cat stroke and a, and a, and a uh, arrested landing. So that's, that's what it brings. But absolutely agree with you about the APG 79. Um, and it's been in service for a long time, hasn't it? So um, a, a good, reliable uh, radar set. Um, Coming back to one from you, uh, the freckle puny. You'll have to uh, tell me how whether I'm mispronouncing that or not. I do apologise if I am. However, uh, how do I rate the uh, Rafale? Yeah, it's a, it's a nice little jet. Pretty, isn't it? Um, it's got French weapons on it, which I don't believe reach quite as far as some of the other weapons, but it's, it's highly manoeuvrable. I fought against a couple of Rafale when I was down the Sea Harrier, and that was the first time that I 
actually got to grips with a um, foreign aircraft. And to be honest, um, because of the, let's call it, uh, Blue Vixen's ability to track that aircraft, I, I rated it higher than I did the Typhoon at the time, or, or the developmental Eurofighter, if you um, take it. Uh, there we go. Uh, so there we go. Uh, Rich Pittman, uh, nice of you to drop in. Thank you. Uh, when was I at Yeovilton? I got to Yeovilton in about 2000 and uh, for 899 and then stayed until uh, very, very early 2006 on uh, all three Sea Harrier squadrons, 899, 800, back to 899, and then to 801 Naval Air Squadron. And uh, yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? I, I, I still um, drive down to the uh, southwest uh, a fair amount. And um, uh, it's a shame going over that hill at Sparkford and there not being a ramp down there anymore and, and no jets in the circuit, as you say. Super cool. So, um, right. Uh, tanking. Uh, and again, it's the, the, the word I, I can't really pronounce. So G hash um, Again, apologies if I've messed that up. When you are tanking, if you look at the probe as you shove it into the drogue, you are in danger of over controlling and breaking the damn thing off, right? So what you do is you get into a waiting position behind it and you you, you offset the probe slightly because as you move towards the um, the drogue, then you're going to move it out the way. So if you can imagine, I'll try and do this on the online, but um, uh, sorry, if, if uh, as you move towards the um, basket, it will move away from you because of your, uh, your um, bow wave. So in the Harrier, used to just get it um, to the sort of 10 o'clock position on the on the basket, a couple of feet back, and then just stare straight ahead at the tanker and drive forward. And we had a little, um, what, what I used to do was find somewhere on the head-up display, line it up with something on the wing, and just push that point in the head-up display towards the wing. And you know what, guess what, nine times out of 10, the hose would go slack and, uh, and you'd be actually tanking, which is obviously cool. And if you got it wrong, the... Um, a hose will whack you around the head or, or around the, the canopy and it would feel really, really bad. So there we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Nick, I, I've already answered that one. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would personally have wished that we'd stayed strong and ended up with cats and traps. I understand the um, reasons for not, as in expediency and industrial simplicity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, what's next? Henry, good evening. Um, Thank you for the question. Interesting, scary stories from Libya or Afghanistan. I never, never felt scared uh, off Libya, to be honest, because I was just there in a supporting role and we were pushing in quite in close. So there was always the mine or coastal artillery threat to worry about. But you know what? That's uh, uh, not necessarily uh, anything I was particularly worried about. Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, you know, a couple of couple of good ones um, just, just by way of being in an active theatre. You know, I was uh, lying in my bed one night, so I had a big bang and the um, rocket fire came in, the walls flexed, and sadly a few of the Bulgarian lads across the street got killed. So, you know, you are in the thick of it in those um, actions. Obviously nowhere near what the infantry guys and what the army guys are actually doing, so please don't take that the wrong way. Uh, but, yeah, so, so Afghanistan had all sorts, Henry, to be honest. Um, we would quite happily do a show force in pretty much zero biz, instrument met flying conditions, really, if that's what the boys and girls wanted. Um, we, we did take um, fire particular tracer on occasion up towards the cockpits. Um, and, but, the, but the real anxiety, really, was the fact that you're trying to get uh, weapons down very close to friendlies. You know, that we went through a bit of time in um, uh, 2008 when most, if not all, of our weapons were within danger close it's, it's just what you do and that just means you have to be on your game you have to know the exactly how your weapon's going to function what the commander's intent is what your roe is etc etc um so so yeah absolutely um afghanistan uh, tailor-made for the harrier you know to have that cas platform and the, and the, the harrier was a superb cas platform um in a um theater made for cas was uh, was pretty special so hopefully that's answered the uh, questions um how did you find learning to hover the Harrier Templar? Um, actually, I, once you get over the fact that it's you and it's now big boys games and it's the sort of thing that grown-ups should be doing, but you're going to do it, uh, very straightforward, actually. It's, it's actually a very stable aircraft in the hover. Um, I found the Harrier too annoyingly stable uh, in the hover, to be honest. And, um, uh, yeah, you in, this, in 899, you got a trip, one trip in the uh, twin seater where they took you to the, the pad and you hovered and they said, you know, hit the pedals, uh, which yours you and just roll gently from side to side. 
a maneuver like that, um, up, down with the power, right, you're done. Um, Tracking me back, and the next time you have a go at it is in the fighter. So, uh, uh, so it, and I'm not saying that by way of, hey, check out how quickly we learned. It's just one of those things that uh, uh, we did. Uh, there's one more about the U, a UFO I know nothing about, really. It's uh, so you that I've never heard of it. Really apologize for that. Um, I don't do any flying in the civilian world, Karen, and um, I don't. <laughs> Uh, I'm not involved with Navy Wings, other than I know quite a few of the fellows down there by by dint of being at Yeovilton. And, uh, and uh, to be frank, I've not been there since they went from being the historic flight over to, uh, to to Navy Wings. But I did see that they've got a CFAR on the books now, which looks absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Hopefully that makes sense. Oh, what's my favourite aviation movie? Um, that's another one from... Uh, Puny. Uh, favorite aviation movie ever has to be um, one of the Star Wars ones because they're all aviation movies, aren't they? Really, um, and anything with squadron or division attacks by X-wings um, would be good. What annoys me about them though is their uh, their RT, their, their their comm is woeful, and I don't understand why. Yes, if you're blowing up the Death Star, you can still check in in order. That that really actually winds me up. Um, there we go. Uh, Yeah, so, so Neuropilot, then um, uh, thank you for your re-attack uh, about the, the, the pod. The thing I did like about the AT Flare was the auto laze capability, by the way, that it has, whereas you didn't, didn't have to remember to, uh, to laze a GBU in it, it did it yourself. Uh, red flag. Yes, sir. Yes, Timberwolf. I did do a red flag. I did a red flag as red air in the Sea Harrier, and I did a red flag as blue air in the Super Hornet. A um, couple of dits. Um, they're actually, uh, this will sound incredibly self-serving, but um, a couple of these are, are in the, the book I've just written, which is, uh, um, I think there's a, a link link there. But um, see, see, Harrier, we got under the Eagle Wall one day, and that was awesome because we got into the middle of the package where they really weren't expecting us. We hid as low as we dared um, between a couple of mountains just to the northeast of Area 51. Uh, when the Eagles, the F-15s passed over the top of us, we elevated really, really quickly um, into the start of the mud-moving packages, and we got um, messed up with all sorts of F-16s, CF-18s. We gunned a couple of the Trons, the EA-6Bs, and at about that point, um, but every Blue Air fighter in the world came to kill us. So um, but we, we'd done our duty for the uh, fatherland or motherland by then, whatever it was we were pretending to be. Um, and uh, another great uh, victory for us on uh, that red flag was um, I managed uh, same trick, exactly the same trick, just in a slightly different place up to the north of the areas, hiding between hills, um, and the sweep missed me, so that meant I could get into the special mission aircraft and, and got in behind a uh, MC-130, which is, you know, that that's what us fighters are after. But fighter to fighter is fun, but it's not going to win you the battle, whereas against a special mission aircraft it might. So that was cool uh, until uh, about a minute later, my stick jammed completely. And uh, and I then had a pretty serious emergency trying to get that aeroplane back on the ground because it was pretty poorly. Um, as far as uh, blue air on red flag, uh, there in a Lot 33 Super Hornet, um, causing a lot of trouble out the front for Raptors to help us out when we needed it, which we didn't really that often. But it's great having the World Police on your side. Um, that was superb. So, yeah, pushing, uh, going first on the first mission of a red flag out the front as a Four ship of super hornets was uh, was pretty cool. Um, hopefully that uh, answers that one. Uh, Darren, thank you for enjoying the book. Um, you know what? Um, I, I never even planned this book, Darren. So uh, so planning another one might be a bit of a stretch. But um, I, I I do have the feeling a slight feeling of unfinished business because what what I what I actually had was somewhere in the region of one hundred fifty thousand words, which I then um, top and tailed into a book and then shrunk to 90,000 words. So there's an awful lot got missing. And uh, one of the, every time I speak to one of my old muckers or someone I knew back in the day goes, oh, is this story in there? Is that story in there? And, and well, there's there's loads that aren't. So uh, it might be a project, but um, but but there we go. And, uh, and yeah, you would have a couple of uh, times about flying the Super Hornet because uh, it was great. Uh, no, so uh, see, see Harry had no SAD capability whatsoever. Uh, and it was actually um, about. Uh, uh, sorry, I've just seen a, uh, a couple of questions further down, which threw me off my stride uh, a little bit. But um, the Sea um, Harrier had no um, 
part in the SEAD game, unless you mean the Super Hornet, which means, yes, we could uh, carry harm. And what you would do as a Super Hornet driver, if you were ever fragged to carry harm, is essentially you'd walk around to the Growler Squadron with your little kneeboard and say, what do you want me to do? Because uh, they were the, um, the experts in that. Uh, so another one uh, on the unmanned system, whatever we're calling it, UFO. Okay, uh, Cab, good evening. Cab, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, I didn't ever try to steal an aircraft carrier. I made a really bad mistake and went to the bridge of an aircraft carrier at four in the morning after an aircrew party. And to say this was seen dimly by the um, aircraft carrier command structure is a minor understatement. And um, they got awfully cross with me and the two people that I was with. And um, we narrowly avoided summary trial and instead we just got stoppage of leave. But um, thank you for bringing that one up. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, no, I, I never never felt the need to steal one. I, I felt like I owned them anyway, Kevin. Um, Su Super Hornet, Carl, does Super Hornet like to fly? Uh, my, my view and other people will, will argue with this and I've said it before on the interviews, um, it, it was super as far as the role goes and the variety of weapons you could fly. So air to air, air to surface, um, it, it can even drop mines. Um, that's not a secret, you can Google it. It can fire a harpoon, it can carry a buddy store for tanking. Uh, so it's absolutely fabulous. And um, uh, was was the handling carefree? Well, to be honest, you, there was no alpha limit. You just, um, there was no point going beyond about 30, 35 or so because you, you, you were then the wrong side of the, um, the, the curve but but yeah it was a superbly um, maneuverable and in particular the ability to get some nose movement going so for example if you committed nose low in a in a harrier you'd have to be fairly ginger about what, what you did with the stick i guess whereas with the super hornet both hands on the stick and pull it all the way back so uh, there we go um uh, da -da -da -da. Further to red flag, were you at hover? No, 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 no. Just, just low, just minding my own business, but between hills, etc. So, uh, we, were, I think we were flying by UK training rules, so 250 feet, but that puts you behind hills, and uh, and guess what? Then uh, no uh, radar can see through a hill. A hill is easily the best chaff cloud in the world, just like the sun is the best flare. Um, so. H, can you talk about how British Naval Aviation, AEW, came along after the Falklands? Yeah, um, I, I can. I, I wasn't ever on one of those squadrons, but very quickly after the Falklands War, you'll recall in the Falklands War, there was a, um, a problem with low-flying Argentine aircraft getting in low. Guess what? Because uh, curvature of the Earth masks you, doesn't it? I know that we all know the radar equation, um, 1.23 root height plus root height equals the radar horizon. Um, that's a problem if root height is uh, the, the height of an antenna. Um, if you can put the um, antenna up at 10,000 feet, then uh, you've got 100 times that, haven't you? Because uh, square root of 10,000, am I right? That's 100. So um, so there you go. So if you're at 10,000 feet, theoretically, your, your radar horizon at sea level is at 123 miles which is useful. And uh, they did this by bolting search water radars onto the bottom of uh, seeking helicopters. And, and that the Mark II was, um, it was a, not a rush, well, rather a rush job because they rushed it, but it was a good rush job. But the Mark VII was a, a, a breed apart, you know, it was a proper um, process display, et cetera. Uh, so varying views of the Harrier and air-to-air. -air. Um, the Harrier could, do a couple of things well if you got into the visual arena. I, you could fly very slow, for example. Uh, if you got um, useful at it, you could you could be easily um, in the Sea Harrier at least. Uh, stick all the way back, flying controlled at about 70 knots, and uh, quite a few other jets didn't like being that slow, so might push out in front of you and and give you a stern aspect shot. Uh, the, the long and the short of it is though that, that you have to get into the visual arena, don't you, from the beyond visual arena. Um, and if you're not, and if you die far out, then everything else is is largely academic. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. I, and we going back to a previous question: the um, uh, the Sea Harrier was very good at throwing uh, BVR shots with the AIM-120, but it only had four of them. You know, and and most things in in life in aviation are a uh, compromise. So you know, if you are going to run out of shots if you've only got four, and then you're in the visual arena without any shots at all so then you're going to be poorly placed uh, uh, 
No, uh, Neuropilot, uh, Fleur pod to locate raptors at flag. No, uh, that was done using the Mark One eyeball and the um, mouth and ears equation of just, just listening into where they were. And they were superb, by the way. They were the Hawaiian National Guard and some USAF guys. Um, Ian probably answered this. Uh, the, the Super Hornet, it wasn't carefree. Um, it's actually quite heavy occasionally on the stick because the, the, the wing used to camber a lot to give you a lot of lift. But that meant that you had to really uh, bully the uh, aeroplane to uncamber the uh, uh, under under the wing. Bill, you'll have to tell me what is the tedious issue with the RAF you're talking about. I, I can think of a few, but I, I don't know. Um, did I read the Superhonic Block Three in particular? It's quite. Um, Timberwolf, I'm sorry, I, I'm unfamiliar with the block nomenclature for. Um, Super Hornet. I know that the uh, lot 3334 was the one I flew, um, and so I don't know whether they've added more thrust since uh, since then. Um, it, it had more than enough thrust, to be honest, and uh, and you 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 could be at the G limit, uh, probably publicly stated, but over seven, which isn't nowhere near as much as uh, other aeroplanes, but you'd still be accelerating with with, um, with with the blowers in. So hopefully that makes uh, sense, um, and I. I think that the last one I've got for now, the favourite place to uh, low level in Wales, the lakes or Scotland? That is a great question. And I think I have favourite valleys in all three. But there were a couple of really cool places to go for, uh, low flying in the um, just just between the between the central highlands and the and the um and the coast if you headed out west if you knew which valleys you were heading for there were absolutely superb um uh valleys you you could you could get into um so neuropilot thank you very much indeed sorry just, so Ian, just to wrap that one up i would say it has to be scotland and, and scotland's got the great glen you probably only have to fly down the great glen once because it's actually quite big and it's not very exciting uh, when you get in there, but there there are all sorts of places that uh, you can get into um, out in the, the the rest of the Highlands. So hopefully that makes um, sense. Uh, Darren, was the tornado a waste of money? Uh, I, 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 I don't think so, uh, Darren. I, I'm, I'm a little unfamiliar with all of the genealogy of the tornado, to be honest, and I've got great friends who um, flew the tornado. I also have a cousin who did very well flying the, the tornado. So I think as a um, mud mover, I don't think you can complain about the, the tornado, really. I think it, it did a good job. It had a couple of uh, recce capabilities as well. And as a sort of earlier bomber, by being a quite high wing loading aircraft, it was probably quite stable as a um, gun bombing uh, aircraft i think if you look at the tornado f3 you might want to scratch your head about um british procurement i think i'm right in saying uh, go with this but the uh, f15 came into service in 1976 so that sort of sets the bar for air defense platforms right and i think the same year was the year that the f3 adv flew so flew in 76 and came into service in 83 so it was already seven years off the pace of something it was far worse than. And, and I assume that no matter what you think, and I know Mike's a big fan of, um, in particular, how the F3 looks, I don't think anyone is going to be uh, arguing that the F3 was in any way the um, air defense fighter that the, uh, that the F-15 was. So um, I, I think that uh, you, you might want to consider why we were bringing that class of platform into service um, in, in the 1983 timescale. But, but then again, uh, and, and again, it's not a spear at a particular platform, but you, you don't get all that much more than an F-15 by the time you even get to the, um, the Typhoon. And you're now what? Um, I think the Typhoon actually got into squadron service 2003, 2006. So something like almost 30 years um, off the pace. So what, what a fabulous um, aircraft the F-15 is, though. It's, it's just genuinely superb. I, I did read a... Um, disappointing uh, article once that said that the F-15 had actually been discounted from operating in the UK air defence environment because as a single seater, it couldn't possibly be um, competent enough, which is obviously a, a bit daft. So, 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 so Darren, um, uh, no is the simple answer. The Tornado, particularly as a, a mud mover, was a, a great aircraft and, and the, the, the spine of the Royal Air Force for quite a uh, long time. 
Uh, Bill, I, I can't speak for the entirety of the Royal Navy, which is 35,000 people. Um, and so I don't know who you think thinks that the RAF shouldn't be in existence. Uh, the, the, the British Army, although, you know, if you look in the open press at the moment, did have a hard time in the integrated review justifying why um, it, what its role was was going to be. And I think all services ought to do that. So, so maybe you have a sort of a second tier point there, I guess. Um, what can UAVs do? Uh, Jack, great question. So, so, so unmanned air systems, autonomous, remotely piloted, etc. then um, anything that's dangerous or dull. So you could imagine them doing the AEW role if uh, things were automated, etc. Uh, you could uh, imagine them doing a carrier strike with some sort of ISR type platform or, or any sort of stand in standoff jamming, I would have thought. But anything that you need people to... Uh, um, stay up a long time or do anything daft with. And, and to be honest, there, there's no, yes, the carrier adds complexity for launch and recovery options, but um, uh, by and large, the air power roles are still going to be the same. So uh, anything from the, uh, the boat that it, it could be doing uh, from the uh, land. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Templar, just quickly. Uh, yeah, I was annoyed um, that they stopped the Harrier in service. But, but don't forget, and, and this is a point that, that people often forget. I think everyone was. I mean, it, you're not. It's not like there were champagne corks popping in tornado messes and at typhoon bases. Everyone was sad that the uh, the Harrier went out of service. It was a it was a useful aeroplane and a, and a British um, icon. So, so yeah, yeah, you. Those are my views too. My only sadness about the whole thing is that some people started essentially spinning pretty gash dits about the Harrier and how ineffective it was compared to X or compared to Y, which takes us back to that original point of when you add in all the yeah buts and the, and the what ifs, then it, it, it wasn't a, an incompetent platform. It was a, it was a fabulous, fabulous platform. And um, uh, I've got no heartache at all with it being taken out of service as a, um, uh, as a sensible way of saving money if that's what you decide to do. But, uh, but you, you, one ought to make these decisions um, with full essay and just accept them is is my opinion. But uh, but thank you for the questions. Um, Ian the Moffat, yeah, great. The, the Moffat was cool actually. Although um, and this probably will embarrass me, I used to find finding the Moffat quite hard. Getting into it and getting out, as in uh, getting out in the free it was around Dumfries, wasn't it? Was easy. But there were a couple of occasions where you just is it around this corner or is it around that corner? Um, so probably me just being inept. But uh, but yeah, the Moffat was a as a good one. Uh, um, and Timbal viffing, yeah, yes, you everyone should viff. Uh, the Harrier could viff, and it could offer you advantage when it. The trouble with viff was a people didn't use it when it was appropriate, and b people overused it. If you were confident and competent at using viff, then it could be used quite effectively to tighten the turn when you need to, just for that little last bit of um, nose authority, or to get really slow, really quickly to fly someone out in front of you. Usually, when you were coming down the hill. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, de definitely VIF should have been in everyone's um, well, well oiled um, box of tricks. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, uh, uh, one from Mike. How often do you work, did you work with the USAF? Um, USAF, we used to actually, uh, and this is a personality thing rather than a machine thing. We used to think that the F-15 Charlies in particular out of Lake and Heath gave a very, very good red air presentation. So we would actually go and detach to Lake and Heath whenever we could on the Sea Harrier and uh, work with the F-15 Charlies because they, they were a superb service. And we like to think that we gave that service um, back to them. Um, uh, ski jump and arrested landing. Uh, it, it's a player. I mean, I, they've sent a Super Hornet off the off the ramp. Um, I don't know what fuel load it had, but you, you could do that if you, if you really wanted to. So, you know, you might think about the carrier as maybe a diver option for US Navy or whatever. So it all depends on how much you can actually take off the ski jump without uh, collapsing your nose wheel, which was the um, big uh, issue with ski jump launches. So actually there was a maximum speed for a ski jump launch as well as a minimum. So you had to be beyond minimum distance so you could go flying, but uh, within maximum so you didn't collapse your undercarriage as you, as you hit the ramp. Um, no, never went to uh, an RAF base in Northern Ireland, NI. Uh, I assume that's Northern Ireland as well. So so no, no SA at all. In, in fact, it was only when I left the military that I went to Northern Ireland for the first time. Um, Jack, Aiden Cannon the whole time. Yes, air to surface and air to air, uh, air to air against the banner with the air, Aiden Cannon. 
uh, it was a uh, the game was actually I believe a German Second World War design, 30 mil, so quite a low rate of fire. But you know what? Um, if you can take a 30 mil round through your aeroplane and not feel it, then uh, you're a better man than me. Um, everything within an aircraft should be absolutely necessary. So a 30 mil hole through it is obviously going to do some uh, damage. Um, and no, I never try, trained on the Sea Eagle. When I was a sub lieutenant and I went to 899 just for a look around, they were still using Sea Eagle or at least briefing it then. But by the time I uh, qualified, it was it had been taken out of service. So I think that the weapon itself was was probably taken out of service. Um, LZ uh, transition Harrier one to Harrier two. Um, the guys on 20 Squadron were superb. Uh, the Joint Force, by the time I got there, but mainly mainly Royal Air Force, they were superb, uh, and I worked hard. And I think that that's probably how things have to happen in that situation. Um, that the, the jet itself was easier to fly, a lot easier to fly, uh, although it, it was so easy um, in that it was quite stable that that became quite cumbersome. I liked the manoeuvrability and the hover of the Harrier One, particularly at night uh, off the boat, I found. But, but you know, that, that's purely just me knowing what I, I know and love. The um, Harrier II um, also had a, a, a more intuitive, for example, store system, and I had a, had a moving map to keep you out of trouble that the, the Sea Harrier um, didn't. So there we go. Uh, ho hopefully that answers the question. And single pilot to multi-crew. I've never flown multi-crew, so I can't answer that question. Um, uh, LZ, and, and this, I would say this, uh, wouldn't I? But um, uh, I, I've always thought that a good warplane can give the driver all the SA he or she needs to make the decisions at, at the correct time. And in the GR9 and in the Super Hornet, you had all that information. So I, I, I'm not being either big headed or, or, or just trying to be um, deliberately argumentative. But I, I, I felt in the Super Hornet in particular that I didn't really understand what, where the F model fitted in, given that the E model was superb at giving you all that um, information that, uh, that, that you needed. Um, Ian, I can't speak for a whole community about um, Sharky Ward. I've spoken to people who are in the Falklands with him, and uh, they say that um, it was actually quite nice to have someone who you felt every time they were going up the ramp was genuinely out to go and hunt the enemy to the ends of the world and further if they needed to. Uh, and I think that's probably where he um, reached his, his zenith, if you will. I know he's uh, made a bit of a um, name for himself commentating on, on things since. Uh, which which is his his own perks and uh, and not really mine and I certainly can't um, comment on how a community feels from him but um, hopefully that makes sense a, a a wartime leader that seemed to do the job uh, quite well down south if that makes sense. Um, Jeff Asco, hi, good evening. I've got no idea um, about the Indian Fleet Air Arm to be honest. I know they bought thirty Mark Fifty Ones. Um, I remember them being at Yeovilton when I was a uh, child, and uh, but apart from that, then. Um, no idea. Uh, hurrah, hurrah, maybe. Um, Hornet or Viper? Never flown either. I flew the Super Hornet, uh, and I've gone up against both in combat. I think they both seem to be very useful um, machines in the fact they're obviously super proof when you look at the, what is it, Block 60 F-16s and what they've managed to do to them, and the later Block Super Hornets, then they've obviously got a lot of growth potential in them. Uh, so they, they, they both seem to have done uh, fabulous jobs. And, and guess what? If you walked into one of their crew rooms, then um, they would both be very devoted to their, um, their aeroplane. Um, yeah, I'd have quite like to have flown the, the Buccaneer. That, that looks like fun, doesn't it? Um, particularly getting it back to the deck, because I don't think it had a HUD, did it? Pass? Don't know. But uh, yeah, they seem to be, um, be, be pretty good at um, particularly the low-level strike thing. And also, they were they, they were actually a pretty um, joint force, weren't they? Because I think there was a naval air squadron at Honington, maybe. But uh, and and joint always makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, going back to uh, and I, uh, there was someone obviously fishing for me to say something um, or, or trying to wind me up early. I can't remember really. But um, the the joint and counter joint argument is just nonsensical, and um, uh, it's only the very senior, very very senior and above people, and the very very junior people that actually indulge in that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, midshipmen, pilot officers, and Admirals and air chiefs. Everyone else just gets on. We're, we're, we're one big team, and it's um, it's uh, quite nice, which is uh, which obviously worked for the Buccaneer as well, because I, I know that uh, Royal Air Force air crew in particular kept fleet air arm squadrons going, or at least that's 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 how I read it. Um, what makes a JTAC, Darren? That's a good question. Um, from my pilot's point of view, the, a JTAC is the person who can put himself in the cockpit, and uh, and the best CAS pilot is the sort of person who can put himself on the ground. So the person who um, 
uh, can try and see the battle from someone else's perspective. And the, the key, therefore, is getting yourself into that space where you're both talking about the same battle. But uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, Carl, um, what's my favorite thing about the Super Hornet? Uh, definitely uh, uh, nose pitch authority in the, in the fight, the, just the ability to back stick whenever you want and, and take those angles if, if you needed to. But there, there's loads to love about it, to be honest. Um, and I, uh, radio studs, uh, essentially, um, a radio frequency will be a set of six numbers, something, 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 point, something, 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 uh, either UHF or VHF. And if you know it beforehand, you can just have them in as a, a stud. So, um, and you will know what those are pre-mission. So when air traffic says, or oh, contact these frequent on this frequency, instead of queuing in um, six different frequencies, you just say, guys, this one's pre-programmed, that's in stud 12. So you just turn to channel 12 instead of a, uh, a frequency. And then you get into this joint nonsense of the, I think the RAF calls them studs and the Royal Navy calls them either channels or buttons, but I'm sure we can get over that. Um, hardest landing in the Harrier, the, um, poor weather in Herrick, unable to see the runway in dust, uh, low fuel when I missed the boat first time around in the Sea Harrier, I had to go around for a second go, but there was a four ship of Harrier GR7s trying to get on at the same time. So um, uh, that was a little bit unsatisfactory, and I landed with far, far too little fuel. Um, hurrah, hurrah, buzz the tower. We used to do what we call a um, little bit of gamesmanship here, but we used to call doors checks uh, on the range. So never at an air traffic control tower, but uh, yeah, um, we used to ask the range if they'd do a doors check for us, and that was our excuse to fly past quickly and, and low and get them to check our panels. Uh, and also we flew a um, approach to the ship, which was called the low slot. So the slot would be over the top of the boat at 600 feet to turn downwind to land. Low slot would be 100 feet or below along the flight deck on the left-hand side to break and you know, just give people something to look at, which is uh, quite exciting, I suppose. Um, cool, thanks for the information on the F-16. Uh, Hey, uh, Timbal, the, the, the problem with uh, so hovering, this, this is probably a statement to the obvious, but hovering, you're chucking enough air out the bottom of the jet to, to, to keep you uh, hovering. And that means that if it's hot or if it's high, which both lead to low density air, then there'll be less air going through the turbine and less coming out the bottom. Therefore, you won't have hover performance. And actually, in, in, so if you had a war load on, that, that would be physically impossible, essentially. So um, uh, that, that was... Um, no is the simple answer because you, you'd crash. Um, and in in the in the Sea Harrier, when when I was there, you know, tired engines, etc. You're probably looking at what one one and a half thousand pounds of gas maybe to be able to hover. So nowhere near a, a war load of um, weapons and, and, and gas, if that makes sense. Um, I'm afraid. I don't know what the HS-1216 is, unless that's the supersonic follow-on to the P-1127. Um, Jack, uh, yeah, it's, it's a shame, isn't it? There, there were the, the, I think the engine, is that not, uh, maybe I'm thinking of P-1154, uh, of which the engine is still in the Fleet Aero Museum. It looks like a Pegasus but with stacks of um, heat shielding on it, because I think it had a reheat capability as well. Um, there we go. Uh, Nick, I have a feeling that the Harrier would have uh, glided like a bunch of keys. And uh, no, you, you, you would always think the cards were quite simple. Then you eject in the event of a catastrophic engine failure or um, something like that. Um, So, uh, no, what additional info does Datalink provide? Um, well, it, it tells you what everyone else is looking at. So you don't just get your own sense, you get everyone else's and you can tell what other people's weapon loads is and what their fuel loads is, is that sort of thing, So, which is, which is all fabulous. Um, would that over clutter a display? No, not really, I don't think so. Um, and yes, you could have it uh, overlaid on a moving map. You just need some way of the machine telling you that's not your own radar track, that's, uh, that's uh, someone else's. Um, the, I think the canted out pylons on the Super Hornet goes back to the previous point of um, that it, it could be fixed if you think it's a problem, but um, it, it probably isn't given what the aircraft is used for and the amount of investment it would need to um, put it right. So you've got to have it in your own head that it needs to be put right first, I guess. Um, and oh, Jack, thank you for that, um, the, the, the twin boom one. Now, now 
Yeah, you're right. So, w- w- well, w- weren't we good at uh, thinking up aircraft as, as Brits back in back in the day? Um, a- a- absolutely. And uh, and only some of them could um, come to fruition. And uh, I think I'll knit down. Bill, uh, Bill, I don't know, to be honest, mate, because I, I never flew any others. I, the, the Harrier was a demanding aircraft to fly, but I'm assuming that so was the Jaguar, so was the Tornado, so was the Tornado F3. Um, uh, you obviously have the single seat thing to worry about, but like I say, sometimes that's a bit of a blessing. Actually, it's just you. You know, you're not going to get an argument with yourself. Um, and I and I, I'm, I, I'm fairly commenting on the twin seat world there because I, I genuinely don't know how they operate. But uh, um, don't know is the answer. It it can't have been too difficult to fly because otherwise it wouldn't have been so good. You know, it it, it was a fabulous war going aircraft, and that that has to mean, doesn't it, that it can't have been too demanding to fly. Um, Ian, I'll just crack through these last ones. Then first solo was actually in a hawk out of in a hawk. First solo in a jet was out of um, Valley, which was great uh, because it was nice to be up there on your own without anyone in the back nibbing you. And uh, we used to have a little silly competition about how fast we could fly around the uh, island of Anglesey. So we used to go up to altitude, bunt to uh, unload the jet, zero G to as max as, as you could, and then um, uh, just have fun trying to get it back on the ground. So that was. Um, that was cool. Uh, I think I said it on Mike's interview, Tim Borf. The uh, my my, my favourite aircraft that I never flew. Uh, I loved the three I did fly. The only other one I've really wanted to fly was the F4U, the Corsair, because I just think it looks great. The um, uh, the Goldwing looks fabulous. The performance is staggering, and its history is really cool as well. And I, I just think it looks great. Um, tanking in the Harrier. Uh, Bit of a doddle really but uh, you just had to get used to the fact that the probe was actually just behind your left ear but so long as you stayed disciplined and stayed on the references then it, it wasn't um, uh, much uh, much of a big deal uh, compared to other aircraft and I, I said earlier just so long as you stayed on your references on the head-up display and drove straight in to the tanking aircraft itself then then you were generally um, all right uh, I think, Mike, that takes us to the end of the questions, mate. If, um, yeah, I was ju- just about to jump in there, but uh, thank you uh, for coming on, Paul. It's been a great Q&A, and thank you uh, to everyone who joined us tonight. There's some great questions, but before we wrap up, Paul, uh, can we still find your book online, and where can we find yourself online? Uh, that's a great question. So start with me. I only really inhabit, uh, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, but I really inhabit Twitter, where I uh, go by the incredibly badly encrypted Paul underscore Tremelling. <laughs> so um, e- easy to find me there. Um, online, the, the book is available from uh, Amazon. You'll also find it in, in Waterstones. It's quite a distinctive title, so reacts very well to a Google. Um, if you want it, though, Mike, if you want it um, signed or anything like that, I've agreed with a local bookshop. If you just Google Marlow Bookshop and in your order, write down uh, what you would like, whether a signature or a dear someone or just some sort of free freehand comments then they'll be able to sort that out so hopefully that makes sense brilliant and i'll link that everything that uh, paul just mentioned there in the description but again thank you uh, everyone for joining us tonight and paul thank you very much my absolute pleasure and thank you for the um the, the questions really really cool to engage all right cheers mate